For the past uh, few years, we've been really uh, focusing on the environmental sustainability of, of dairy and also beef production systems. Uh, today, we're going to really focus on dairy. Uh, dairy farms, along with all other farms, really have a number of environmental impacts. Some of the more important ones that we're looking at, of course, is greenhouse gas emissions. That gets a lot of attention today. We also have volatile organic compounds, and this is a whole suite of different uh, uh, compounds that, that can come from the farm, different alcohols, uh, Acetates, esters, aldehydes, those kinds of things, um, mostly from manure and uh, bunker silos are a pretty big emission source. And then, of course, there's ammonia. Uh, that's also uh, a very important emittent from our dairy farms. And then, of course, we also have uh, nutrient losses. Both nitrogen and phosphorus are the, are the primary ones. We have runoff losses. And we have some, some uh, leaching actually down through the soil profile too that can affect ground, groundwater. So those are the major things that we're looking at. But in addition to that, we also have to consider uh, the impacts of producing resources that are being used on the farm. Things like any purchase feed, animals, electricity, fuel, fertilizer, machinery, and so on. Any important uh, resources that are coming onto the farm there was impact whenever they were produced, and, and we consider that too in, in the total, say, footprint, the environmental footprint of the farm. I'm going to start by talking about our current dairy farms. This is some work we completed a couple of years ago. That's where we need to start. To do that, uh, we did a national uh, assessment of all the dairy farms in the United States. And to do that, we divided the United States up into these six regions. And within each region, we, we gathered information. A lot of good information came from the National Ag Statistics Service, or NAS. Um, but we also had some other survey data, interviews, um, farm visits, and, and other sources. But collected as much information as we could in each of the different regions, looking at the characteristics of the farms, sizes, how they're managed, and uh, productivity, that sort of thing. So with that information, then we modeled 20 representative operations of various sizes and types within each region. We simulated them using the weather and soil uh, of those regions. And from that, we got the various environmental impacts from the model and, and including uh, the cradle to farm gate life cycle assessment of some of the major impacts. So based upon the individual farm data and NAS data on milk production, uh, for each state in the region, we totaled the milk, the environmental impacts based upon the amount of milk that would be coming from each of the individual farm types. So like we had grazing farms and large confinement farms, and, and of course, uh, when they don't, they aren't, they aren't having equal impact. So we weighted them by the amount of milk that they were contributing to the to each state and total the states to get regional totals and then to a, a weighted total of all the regions to get national totals. So hopefully that all makes sense. To do this, the model we're using is the integrated farm system model. This is a model that's been around for quite a few years now. Uh, it's been, uh, I guess, uh, verified and applied to many different situations. Uh, many different dairy and beef production systems. So it's been heavily verified in, 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 in representing a lot of different um, farms. This is a process level simulation of the farm. And what we mean by that, it's fairly mechanistic. We're looking at the various, these major components as shown here, uh, simulating them through time, usually on a daily time step. When it comes to harvest, we get down into an hourly time step also with some of the emissions um, and that sort of thing. So we're simulating these through time based upon weather and soil conditions and so forth, keeping track of the various emissions, the flow of nutrients throughout the system. Uh, we're predicting what the cows are gonna excrete based upon how they're being fed and track those nutrients back to the cropland, uh, predicting the various um, losses that are gonna occur 
And we're keeping track of the major resources, fuel, electricity, fertilizer, the machinery, and so forth, anything that's coming in to uh, produce the feeds and the animals on the farm. So uh, among the various impacts that, that, that the model does predict, we have, of course, methane, nitrous oxide, and carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gases. We have the non-methane VOC emissions, ammonia, nitrate leaching, and runoff of, of nitrogen and phosphorus. And we're looking at phosphorus in both soluble and sediment forms. So that's basically the environmental impacts that the model will produce. In addition to that, then we're doing what we call this farm gate uh, life cycle assessment. So of course we have to look at the impacts of all the major components uh, within the farm. But in addition to that, we have to look up what we call upstream uh, to the production of these major resources that were coming onto the farm. So we look at their impacts too. <clears throat> and then we also look at the indirect impacts. One of the major ones here is really ammonia. Ammonia can drift and transform and uh, deposit in other parts of the environment and have impact there. And so we want to consider that as well. So that's all part of the, in the uh, life cycle assessment portion. And we're doing a life cycle assessment, of course, on greenhouse gas emissions, getting the carbon footprint, basically the milk being produced on the farm. We're also doing fossil energy use. Blue water use, which is defined as non-precipitation, anything that's coming from ground or surface waters that could be used for other things. We want to monitor, we want to look at, at those. And then reactive nitrogen, the reactive nitrogen footprint really is just a total of all the different forms of reactive nitrogen that are uh, going off the farm. So to summarize I, what we found, I, and uh, from this national assessment of, let's say, current dairy farms, basically the greenhouse, the carbon footprint of the milk being produced is around one pound of CO2 equivalent being emitted uh, per pound of fat and protein corrected milk that's being produced. This is the average across all farms, all milk produced in the United States. And the pie chart there shows a breakdown and a number of studies have shown similar breakdowns to this. The major contribution is from the animal, the enteric emissions. Manure can also be a, a major component. Um, and then we have feed production, which is primarily nitrous oxide. And the anthropogenic CO2 is that coming from the burning of fossil fuels, the decomposition of lime and um, urea, that sort of thing. All in all, it's pretty minor, but uh, it's, it is a component. And the resource production then is the produ production of all these other resources that are coming onto the farm. If we look at the total of overall milk in all uh, dairy farms in the United States, it comes out to a little over uh, 100 million tons of CO2 equivalent that's being emitted from our farms. If we look at a breakdown across regions, uh, the Midwest, uh, comes out a little bit on top. Not a close second, though, is the Southwest, which is primarily California. To put this in perspective, this comes out to be about 1.5% of what's reported as, a, as the total greenhouse gas emissions from the United States. When we look at it on a regional level, it varies a little bit, uh, a little higher in some regions than, than others. The fossil energy use it comes out to about 0.3 kilowatt hours of energy per uh, pound of corrected milk produced. And most of that energy is being used in feed production. Um, and also then resource production, which actually uh, includes some uh, purchase feeds as well, but uh, other, other uh, fertilizer, fuels, electricity, so forth. Total of raw milk in all farms, uh, we get 68 billion kilowatt hours of energy that's going into our dairy farms or being used to produce milk on our dairy farms. And the breakdown, again, looks a lot like the, the previous breakdown. Um, 
for the most part, this is based upon animal numbers, but it is influenced some by, by the environment, the climate of the regions. Put this in perspective, it's a pretty minor part of the total U.S. consumption of fossil energy, uh, pretty much less, much less than 1%, even across most of the regions. For blue water consumption, we use about 10 gallons of water to produce each pound of corrected milk. And nearly all of that water is being used to produce feeds, either on farm or purchase feeds. And, uh, and these are irrigated feed production. So it varies a lot across regions. As the breakdown shows here now, the major water consumer, as you might guess, is the Southwest. Um, Northwest is also pretty large, and then some of the eastern regions and the Midwest are, are relatively small in the whole pie chart here. So to all total, 3.1 trillion gallons of water being used to produce milk. And this comes out to be about 3% of total fresh water withdrawal in the United States. So again, it's not huge. Some of the regions, though, it's getting pretty substantial. Some of the Western regions, of course, closer to 10% of what's being used in those regions. And of course, those regions are also the regions that are suffering from scarcity of water in many times. In terms of the reactive nitrogen footprint, uh, in terms of the total, it's, it's kind of a smaller number, 20 pounds of nitrogen, reactive nitrogen that is, that's being lost per ton of corrected milk produced. And most of this is in the form of ammonia, as the pie chart shows. Uh, nitrate leaching, another component, and then the nitrogen, the nitrification and denitrification N2O emissions makes up about 10% and so forth. So looking more at, at, at ammonia emission uh, across the region, uh, here the, the, the Southwest starts to um, become dominant. A lot of this has to do with the warmer climate, also the larger open uh, feedlot dairies that are in that region. All total, 700,000 tons of reactive nitrogen is being emitted from our dairy farms. And comparing that to national inventories is a little concerning. It gets up around 20%. So our dairy farms do come out to be a pretty major contributor. And in some regions, this gets really high. Uh, this, the data for, for the national inventory is a little soft, but I mean, nevertheless, I think we can gather from all this that, that ammonia emissions are a, a, a concern. So the take home from all this was that, that dairy farms have a relatively small impact on, on national inventories, greenhouse gas emissions, fossil energy use, and water consumption overall, although still water consumption is a concern, particularly in the Western regions. Ammonia emissions though, um, if we ever get serious about really um, regulating ammonia, I think that's, that's gonna be uh, somewhat of a threat, a really con a concern. Many things we can do to reduce ammonia emissions, but again, it's it's expensive. So with that then, what we want to do is go back in time and model farms in the early 70s and compare them to today and how their environmental impacts compare to today's. Sorry. Um, there, there have been many changes over the past 50 years uh, on dairy farms. One of the major ones is increased milk production efficiency. We now have 21% fewer cows on farms today compared to 50 years ago, but those cows are producing nearly twice as much milk. We also have greater crop yields, particularly for corn, improved fuel efficiency of machinery, reduced tillage uh, operations, greater use of cover crops, particularly here in the East, more efficient production of fertilizer and electricity and other resources that were coming onto the farm. So all of these things really impact um, the improvements that, that are occurring over the, this time period. Well, gathering the information to simulate farms in the 70s is a little more challenging, but there's still a lot of good information available, particularly through NAS, 
um, things like milk production, milk yield per cow, cow numbers, where the cows are located, the size of farms, uh, the primary crops grown in the dairy counties, crop yields, uh, some information on mortality and replacement rates. And of course, we still we have good information on, on the weather and soils for going back to simulate farms in the 70s. So this is what I would consider as sort of the more critical information. And, and, and we've got pretty good data here. Some of the other things we needed to go interview the experts, I guess, people that were farming or working with farmers at that time to look at things like what were the housing housing facility, facilities used in the various regions, the associated manure handling practices, uh, what was the por portion of non-hosting cattle, grazing practices, tillage practices, uh, fertilizer use, irrigation use, and so forth. But again, we wanted to be very representative of our farms in these regions, but the more critical information, we had a little harder data on. This chart now shows uh, the movement of dairy to the West, and that was a major change across this 50 year period. If you look at the, the red and blue numbers, they reflect the uh, early 70s and current uh, milk being produced in each region. And you can see in the eastern regions, it hasn't changed much. In the western region, particularly northwest and southwest, it has uh, gone up by, by three fold or more. So in, in comparing the eastern to western regions, uh, in the east we have um, declined in cow numbers by about 50%, whereas the west western regions have about doubled. Overall in the nation, 21% less. Milk yields per animal are pretty consistent uh, between the regions, not much change there. And total milk produced, we have a little increase in the eastern regions, but of course a much, a very large increase in milk production in the western regions. And as stated before about twice as much milk nationally. What our simulations indicate is that, that forage consumption across the whole United nation, uh, forage consumption on dairy farms hasn't changed much. Uh, we're using about the same amount of forage today as we did 50 years ago. Of course, between regions that change, that's different. The major change has been feeding more concentrate, particularly byproduct feeds. And overall, our total feed consumption as for dairy farms has increased just 14%. In terms of the milk carbon footprint, we found 1.7 pounds of CO2 equivalent per pound of fat and protein corrected milk in the early 70s. This varied across regions and across production systems. The pie chart breakdown here doesn't look much different than what we saw earlier uh, for current farms, except that manure emissions are a smaller component because of more daily haul systems and less long-term manure storage back then. So in terms of the, the total uh, overall milk and dairy, it went from a little under 100 uh, million tons of sewage to equivalent in 1970s, in the early 70s, to uh, 110 million tons today. So what that means is overall, the intensity um, has improved greatly. So the, the intensity is the amount of greenhouse gas emitted per unit of corrected milk. So this has decreased by 42%. So efficiency is really up as we saw, and that's a big benefit. But still overall, we are emitting about 14% more greenhouse gas today from our dairy farms than we did 50 years ago. Considering that we're producing twice as much milk though, that's, that's a pretty small increase. But in terms of fossil energy use, uh, what we found was 0.7 kilowatt hours per pound of fat and protein corrected milk. Uh, again, variation, some variation across regions, not as much, and variation of course across production systems. The breakdown, um, again, it's a little different. 
uh, more in this resource production uh, segment. But overall comparing, uh, we went from 0.7 to 0.3 kilowatt hours per pound of fat and protein corrected milk and 81 billion kilowatt hours of total overall milk down to 74 billion. So overall, we're, we're, we reduced the intensity by 54% and the total fossil energy use by 8%. So some of the reasons for this, of course, is more efficient electricity production in the grid. Uh, that's been improving quite a bit in, in recent years. Of course, the use of anaerobic digesters and some of the offset that that's coming from dairy farms. So some of these things uh, all add up, more efficient tractors, it's all part of that. In terms of water consumption, we found 13.5 gallons per pound of fat and protein corrected milk in the 70s. Again, much variation across regions and across production systems with high numbers in the West, low numbers in the East. And again, nearly all of that water being used for irrigated feed crop production. So totaled over all milk, we went from 1.5 trillion gallons of water being used in the early 70s to 2.1 trillion today. So overall, of course, by efficiency, the intensity has dropped 29%. That's good, but the total input of water into dairy production, and of course, nearly all this is in the West, we have a 40% increase. Some other things, uh, individual look at methane, nitrous oxide, and anthropogenic CO2, ammonia. Here we have the nitrogen losses and phosphorus runoff, the non-methane VOCs. As far as intensity, the loss per unit of milk produced, we're coming out, out ahead in all of them. We, we've, we've had reductions in all of them, which certainly is good. When we look at the total across all the United States milk produced. Uh, we do have increases in methane, ammonia, and non-methane VOC emissions. And, and one of the drivers on this, particularly VOCs, is the long-term manure storage, large uh, lagoons, uh, more open lot dairies contribute to ammonia and VOCs, also some to methane. But we're still coming out ahead on some of the nutrient runoff losses. We look at the difference between the regions um, in terms of intensity. Uh, there's, there's not much difference. The one that kind of stands out is the non-methane VOC where uh, we've had very little change in the eastern regions and, and some uh, reduction in, in the western regions. But again, looking at the total uh, across the United States in the Eastern regions, in most cases, we have reduced our uh, environmental impacts from our dairy farms in the East. The one exception is the VOC emissions. But of course, in the Western regions, because of the very large increase in cow numbers and so milk production, we have relatively large increases in nearly all of the environmental impacts there. So the take home at this point, uh, the intensities of all the environmental impacts have decreased substantially over the past 50 years, just primarily because of our improvement in efficiency. We're producing a lot more milk with fewer animals and fewer resources today, which is a good thing. For many environmental impacts, the, the, the totals over all dairy farms have decreased. Again, a good thing, but there are exceptions. And the major one would be water, uh, where we have a 40% increase in water use. And again, most of this is in the West, where they need to water. Uh, increases in methane, ammonia, and the non-methane VOC emissions. So all of this work was just recently published in the Journal of Dairy Science. So if you want to dig into it further, that publication is available. So from here, what do we do? Where are we going? Uh, we're, we really want to see what we can do to 
mitigate, I guess? What can we do to reduce the environmental impacts of dairy farms? And right now we're primarily focused on the greenhouse gases. You're probably, many of you are probably aware that the, the dairy industry has set the goal of being carbon neutral by uh, mid-century. So we're looking, what can we do on our dairy farms to help get our farms uh, moving towards that, moving in that direction? So that's really our focus of our work from here. So with that, that's what I have to present today. And I guess there should be time for some questions and discussion.